Okay, yes. Yes, thank you. Uh, um, good morning and good afternoon to all. So now it is past 10 a.m. Bangkok time, and we would like to start the APT WEC Dialogue EWA uh, AO series. Uh, I'm Elisha Raswandari from APT Secretariat, and I would like to welcome you all to the third episode of Expanding Wireless Access Opportunity EWAO. The topic for this third episode is standard power 60 uh, gigahertz Wi-Fi and AF AFC. Uh, I hope you have joined the first and second series as well. The previous series can be found in APT Dialogue web page as well as in YouTube channel. This APT Dialogue is organized by APT in uh, collaboration with Dynamic Spectrum Alliance, a DSA. Uh, in this web dialogue, you will have two speakers. So like our uh, the past episode, uh, we will take all the questions from the participants at the end of both uh, end of both the presentations. So if you have any questions, uh, kindly put the questions in chat box. So we will take open the floor at the end of the presentation. So uh, so now let us start this episode. Uh, I would like to invite Mr. Masanari Kondo, Secretary General of APT, to give his remarks. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you, Elisha. So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Thank you for joining the third and the last episode of this series. And this series of APT Wave Dialogue, Expanding Wireless Access Opportunity, which is organized in collaboration with DSA, focus, focuses on Wi-Fi 6E and discuss it from various aspects. So far, we had two episodes which covered uh, overview of Wi-Fi 6E, use cases and its feature vis-a-vis -vis 5G and attracted many audiences. So today's episode is to see it from uh, automated frequency coordination or AFC and discuss how to ensure the exist existing services and protect from uh, interference. So I believe today's APT Web Dialogue will also provide useful and insightful perspective for the participants. So once again, thank you very much for joining us today and I wish you all a fruitful discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Masanari Kondu. So now I would like to invite Ms. Martha Sauzi, DSA president to give her remarks. Um, thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. Um, or good afternoon or good evening, depending on where, on where, you, where you are. So um, uh, I would like to thank Mr. Kondo for in allowing us as Dynamic Spectrum Alliance to organize this web dialogue series. It's really an honor to work together. And this is the last episode. At this point, I'm sure you are familiar with the different applications and use cases that we could have in the six gigahertz band for unlicensed access. So we have seen that there are devices that could operate at very low power levels. So we're talking about 25 milliwatts, 14 dBm. There are also use cases for low power indoor applications. And there are also uh, use cases for standard power devices. Today, we are going to focus on those type of standard power devices that offer a lot of capabilities, especially for outdoor applications and to enhance indoor coverage. And we are going to cover um, what we call AFC, Automated Frequency Coordination. That is a very exciting part of dynamic spectrum access. And for DSA, it's really a pleasure to see uh, all the developments and all the advances in, that, in this subject. So um, again, thank you so much. We will have great speakers today and then I would give you back the floor. Thank you so much for, for this opportunity. Mm, thank you, Ms. Marta. So now can I request all the uh, panelists to kindly open your video for the short uh, group photo? Mm, yes, can I request everyone to kindly open the video and keep smiling? Uh, my colleague will assist to take a uh, good photo over here. Yes, 
thank you. So now uh, we can now close the video. Now let us start the presentation for this episode. Uh, I would like to invite the first speaker, Dr. Zing Tang, APZ Wireless Policy Manager, HPE um, uh, Arup, for his uh, presentation. Uh, to you, Dr. Zing. Oh, thank you. Okay, let me share my screen. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Depends where you are. My name is Xin Tang from Wireless, uh, from H, uh, Aruba HPE. Aruba is a Hewlett Packard Enterprise company, and we have uh, we are we are industry leader in wide power, wireless uh, wireless connectivity, and SD one. So in the um, before I start, I want to thank APT to host the Wi-Fi dialogue. It's really a good opportunity for the Wi-Fi industry to work with APT regulators and the other industry partners on this hot topic. I also want to thank DSA for sponsoring the event. In the two in the first two episodes, we covered why we need a Wi-Fi 6E and what a Wi-Fi 6E could offer. And today we are going to talk about a, a particular aspect of the standard power use case and how the AFC could enable standard power. In my part, I will talk about the AFC and the standard power use case, AFC theory. And I think later my colleague, Chris from Broadcom will show you a live demo of the AFC. So I know that in, in the APT region, there are some regulators may already started the AFC research while some regulator may just start to uh, um, study the unlicensed use for the six gigahertz. For people first time hearing about the AFC, the AFC is uh, stand for automated frequency coordination. AFC is an automated dynamic spectrum access system that can enable the six gigahertz Wi-Fi standard power use. So when we say automated, we, we mean that the AFC uses a computer to coordinate the spectrum access with predefined regulatory rules. The dynamic access means that the spectrum is coordinated based on the latest incumbent information and it is dynamic. And when we talk about the system, the system contains the, the, the cloud database, which in, uh, include the incumbent, the incumbent, the link, uh, incumbent data and the protection control, and also the in interface to incumbent data store, as, as well as the protocol between the access point and AFC communication. So the AFC will enable higher ERRP license example operation in the six gigahertz at the same time protecting incumbent service. Before joining HPE, I used to work as a spectrum regulator. Because spectrum is congested, one of our daily uh, one of our regular job is enable more spectrum sharing. And the, the challenge is we always see that there is interference if, there, um, if the spectrum sharing is uh, not properly arranged. And because of the interference, we need a huge coordination effort. And sometimes uh, people want to overprotect their service because that will lead to an inefficient use of the spectrum. So that's the pain point in my past job. I found that uh, during when we want to enable more spectrum sharing. So I really hope there is a system, a solution that could get my job done while so my pain points. And at the same time, if the system or the solution can give me the gain, for example, that it could give, uh, tell me the spectrum use insight and it could help me to improve the license data accuracy and that could help me to make my job much easier. So the AFC is the solution that offered the regulator. So AFC solving the problem of the spectrum sharing system, and it relieved the pain by providing a robust interference protection because the, the protection rules are all predefined and this automated program in the computer. And we can use automation coordination to significantly reduce the coordination effort. And because this, um, with this coordination automation, it can improve the spectrum sharing and make the spectrum more efficiently used between, uh, between different users. While in, in addition to the pain relievers, it also adds additional gain. It will tell me, tells the regulator how the spectrum is used across the country and, or in a particular region. And it will also improve the location 
accuracy because the incumbents have an uh, incentive to put them, make sure their location is accurate so they can protect their service. And the AFC is a real-time assignment. It is significant to ease and um, reduce the workload from the regulator. And the last but not the least is the agility from the AFC. So if you change, for example, the propagation model or you change the regulation rule, the system can automatically, uh, can easily to implement that without a massive effort. So let's talk about why we need a standard power. There are, well, the Wi-Fi industry has defined a few uh, standard power use case. So first, the use case is uh, standard power will extend the foot, um, people's footprint from indoor to outdoor. I remember about 10 years ago, people used to call um, Starbucks as the third place. It's the third place between your home and your office. One of the reasons Starbucks could play a, so, such an important role, uh, such an important place in people's daily life is that Starbucks has a very good Wi-Fi connectivity. So think about it, if you have a standard power now can deploy that at outdoor, so people's footprint can in, extend to outdoor or whatever, wherever, as long as, as long as there is a good Wi-Fi coverage. So any place with, uh, can be a third place in the future. The second use case is in the large venue or stadium. You probably remember that in the first episode, um, our colleague Mark from Cisco and this, and described the massive data throughput at the Super Bowl. So the Wi-Fi standard power could ease the spectrum congestion and address the data demand at such an event. So this picture, there are two Wi-Fi in, uh, AP integrated into the real hand rail enclosure. The third use case is uh, industry automation. So Wi-Fi could um, connect a lot of uh, IoT sensor in a factory or in a warehouse, at the same time enable the industry automation. Same as the agriculture. The agriculture is a very important sector in Asian Pacific countries. Wi-Fi could enable the uh, auto automated uh, ir irrigation and also uh, some, there are even some more advanced application that can real-time monitor the insects. And the Wi-Fi as a standard power could also help the city planner to do a better job with the IoT, with the different IoT sensor and the surveillance camera. The city planner can better monitor the traffic congestion inside the city. And if there is an incident or emergency is happen, the city planner can always divert the most and the most efficient resource to the place. But last but not the least is the standard power can help to reduce the digital divide. So this is very important in countries with larger rural geography, like countries in Australia and New Zealand. In some places that there are people and there are sparse population, and it's not easy for the fiber operator to roll out the fiber to serve this area. For example, in New Zealand, a lot of operators using the UD1 band five, lower five gigahertz to uh, to connect the last meter home residential broadband while at the same time using the uni three band, the high five gigahertz as a backhaul link because the uni three band has higher EIRP. So six gigahertz Wi-Fi could do the same job. It could, people could, and the broadband provider can use the five gigahertz for, for access and point and use a six gigahertz for backhaul link. So this will um, address the future demand of the broadband throughput in the rural area. So when we uh, have the wife 6E standard power, the first thing we want to protect the incumbents because the six gigahertz is not a greenfield spectrum. So let's look at how the, how the six gigahertz is currently used by different service. Across the region one and two and three, they are pretty much very similar incumbent use case in the six gigahertz. Frequency from 5925 to 7075 are used by fixed service, fixed satellite service and mobile as a core primary allocation. A frequency from 7075 to 7145 has fixed and mobile use. In addition to fixed, fixed satellite and mobile, the ITU also required the administration to protect the radio astronomy service at, from the frequency 6650 to 66752 megahertz. 
So with this incumbents in mind, the Wi-Fi industry had defined three different device class to protect the incumbents. We talked about the low power and the very low power in the early episode. And today, this, uh, we will focus on the standard power. So the standard power, the regulator requires the standard power must have a fixed indoor or outdoor location. And the standard power has the, uh, the restriction because of the higher ERRP, there are more restrictions. For example, standard power cannot have a ERRP above the elevation 30 degrees. They must uh, restrict their ERRP pointing to the sky. And the standard power need to have uh, automated geolocation capability. And the most important thing is the standard power AP need to be controlled by a AFC protocol. Even with those three different class, it doesn't mean that the stand power access point can access any frequency of the 60 gigahertz. Then this, this is because some of the band are used by mobile service. So mobile service is because it's hard to know where they are located, where they are deployed. So it, it can be harder for standard power, stand power AP to coexist with this mobile service. So in this example, I list the Canada and the US six gigahertz use and uh, spectrum use. So as you can see that in US, the Uni5 and the Uni7 channel are used by fixed, uh, fixed service and the fixed satellite service. While the Uni6 channel is used by mobile broadcast auxiliary service as well as the Uni8. So when the FCC defined the, um, the spectrum for stand power AP to access, it excludes the Uni6 and Uni8 because it could not be shared with the stand power. While in Canada, the I and the Canada do not have the mobile service deployed in the Uni6 band. So the can so Canada can have more spectrum for stand power to use. The good thing is a lot of Asian Pacific countries even do not have the mobile service. So in theory, if there is no mobile service within the six gigahertz, you can pretty much use the whole six gigahertz as a standard power. And the AFC system is agile enough to adjust the change, adjust the variation from different administrations. So let's look at how the AFC is deployed. And there are multiple AFC solutions. Currently, there are about 14 solutions proposed to the FCC. This is just one very typical example. And uh, I believe a lot of uh, AFC solutions are very similar to each other because we all based on the Wi-Fi Alliance specification. So in this diagram, you can see there are um, different components to, uh, for, um, for AFC to deploy. So first, we, have, we, we need to have AP. And this AP could either a standalone AP or a cluster of AP controlled by a network controller. And the network controller will behave as a proxy for this AP. And in Aruba, Aruba has a, a cloud called Aruba Central. So this is cloud, and this is central cloud that we will have, we'll communicate and coordinate those AP or AP cluster. By the, and the other side of the, and the cloud, we are in the Aruba Center, we'll have a communication protocol to the AFC system. The AFC system on the one side of AFC, AFC system, it provides interface to the AP or to the cloud. And the other side, it needs to talk with the incumbent database, which we call the universal, uh, universal licensing system. And this database uh, contains data published by the regulator, either the FCC or the Canada asset. So the, the database will load the uh, radio astronomy location, fixed link location into the, uh, into the uh, database for the AFC system to look, for, look to. Let's look at uh, how the uh, AFC works. So first time when, and so when the AFC is uh, enabled, sorry, when the AP is enabled, the AP or the AP cluster will first report the location to Aruba Center. And after the Aruba Center collects the information of the location, the regulatory ID, the, uh, and the AP ID, the Center will forward the information to AFC system. And AFC system, once the AFC system identify the location of this AP, AFC system will search the universal licensing database to find the uh, potentially, could be a potentially affected uh, fixed link. And same time, AFC system will verify whether this AP uh, in the trust list of, uh, of the, from the regulator. And after the AFC system identified the, uh, the, the incumbents, it will report back the available channels and maximum ERRP for each channel. 
and the data will be reported back to the Aruba Central Cloud. And then Aruba Central Cloud will control the AP or the AP cluster to for the AP to pick up which channel to operate and uh, what's the maximum ERP each AP uh, allowed to uh, operate. And this is this is not a one-off process. Every 24 hours, the AP need to do that job again. Need to update this uh, in information, update the location information to AFC system. And AFC system will make sure their location is up to date. If the AFC system does not receive the location within 24 hours, it will give another 24 hours grace period to allow the engineer to remedy the failure. But if the engineer cannot solve the problem within 24 hours, the AP must stop to operate. So let's look at on the RF side, how does AFC can protect a fixed service? So as we talked um, about to, then to, for the AFC to protect the fixed service, the first thing is that they need to know where this service are allo uh, allocated. So this includes the data and the location from the fixed link, from the incumbent fixed link and from the AP as well. And once the AFC system know the location of the AP to be, uh, to be deployed, the, the AFC will check the affected fixed link based on the geolocation. And after the, after the, A, the AFC identified the affected AP, uh, sorry, I affected the fixed link, AFC system will calculate a 3D protection area in front of each fixed service receiver. And the, the um, FCC uses minus 6 dB interference over noise ratio at uh, each fixed service receiver as the protection criteria for both the co-channel and adjacent channel protection. So in this example, as you can see, this green AP here is located outside the protection area of this fixed service, fixed service receiver. And this AP, the AFC, we report back to this AP. It can use any channel the AP wants with an minus the unit six because a AFC is not permitted within this frequency. While this AP is unlucky to fall into the protection contour of the fixed link. So the AFC system will tell the uh, fixed link that is six, uh, they will tell the AP that is 6300 to 6330 is currently used by the fixed service channel. The AP need to avoid the channel that the fixed service is currently using. So that block out two 20 megahertz channel and 140, 80 and the uh, 160 megahertz channel individually. So the protection contour is not just a, a single contour, is that the AFC system actually generates a series of a contour. And the contour is the varies with the ERP and the terrain. As you can see in this picture, there are a set of a contour generated by the AFC system. In the center of the contour of the circle, that is where the AP, uh, there is a, that is the fixed service uh, receiver. As, um, as you can see, there are different contour for different ERP. The so most inner protection contour is for the lowest ERP, and the most outside contour is for the, um, the higher ERP. This is very easy to understand because uh, when you have a higher ERP AP, you need more distance. You, you need you need more distance between the AP and the fixed fixed service receiver to separate. And the. Uh, the the protection contour is also affected by the terrain. As you can see, there is the protection contour has a lot of a cutout. And this is because the building cluster and the uh, building cluster and the contour uh, and the uh, terrain that can block the RF propagation. However, if the AP and the fixed service are deployed above the cluster, you don't benefit from the terrain and uh, the uh, building. So this actually creates an incentive for the Wi-Fi operator to use as little power as necessary to complete their deployment because uh, the lower ERP they have, the more freedom they have, they have to deploy in, in, in within the location. So FCC defined uh, different propagation models and the, the propagation model have a separate dis distance within 30 meters between 30 to one kilometer and over a kilometers. I'm not going to talk about the detail. I think Chris will later in his demo, he could talk about how can we can configure the propagation model. All right, let's look at the, the AFC situation and outlook in the US. The, the AFCC charged the, the industry with addressing the detail on AFC and the standard power implementation. 
The, the Wi-Fi Alliance and the Wireless Innovation Forum are the two standard, standard development organizations leading the industry effort. So they have de delivered a working on the system to uh, device interface, the SUT and DUT test specification, the AFC requirements, test the vectors, code, et cetera. And the, uh, there are the, the industry will provide the AFC solution. So in Q4 last year, the FCC has connected the proposal that, uh, from 14 companies that have submitted the proposal to the FCC. Now there's one company that has withdrawn the proposal. What happened next? So the FCC will um, grant a conditional approval to the qualified AFC applicants. But the FCC at the same time will go through a period of lab and field testing. And after the testing and, uh, and after the lab and the field testing, FCC will approve the AFC operator for commercial service. But in parallel, the FCC will also define the test, the, the, the process of certifying the standard power AP. So let's look at the system reference model published by Wi-Fi Alliance. So the most important part for the AFC system that is you, you need to have a data repository that stores all the protection control and the database and the protection database. And the other and the other important module is you need to have a cloud computing function which can do the frequency or availability calculation. And the AFC system need to have two interfaces. The first interface is to the incumbent database to um, for the system to look uh, look up the uh, to look up all the fixed link data. And the interface to the AP is allow the system, AFC system to control and communicate to the AP. And the Wi-Fi Alliance also defined the test specification. So there is a, um, the test point is here show in the diagram on top of the test point, there is a system on the test, uh, system on the test for testing the AFC system. But the, under the test point, there is another test specification which define how the, uh, how the device can be tested. So this uh, architecture only works for is is specific to the Wi-Fi technology. If there are if the, the you use like a different technology in the six gigahertz, that might need a different AFC system reference model. So this is an example of uh, Federated Wireless, one of the AFC solution provider. Aruba is a partnership with the uh, Federal Wireless to deliver the six gigahertz AFC. So as uh, so you can see that uh, the, um, the great database here is uh, for, the, for the incumbent uh, license data, terrain and antenna model for the AFC, for the federated wireless AFC to calculate the PSD, the per, um, spectrum protection spectrum density. And also there are databases for radio observatory zone, border protection, and the, the uh, trust list of the device. At the same time, the AFC defined the protocol of, um, between the device and the system. So I can, let me show you that uh, um, um, a demo of the AFC and the uh, power adaptability. So this is the, this AP connects to the Federated, uh, Federated Wireless AFC system and it uses a US database. So as you can see the top of the, uh, the, uh, the apps is the PSD allowed for each channel, each frequency. And there are different channels available. The green shows all the channels are available. So you have 20, 40, 80 and 160 megahertz channels. So if I put uh, antenna height like 10 meters and uh, height identity of one meter and I choose outdoor operation, I can certainly get the result. There are some channels are blocked because there are fixed link uh, nearby that could block this channel and make this channel unusable. So this is a real uh, real world example. We put the, uh, we put our AP in the center of Dallas, and all the solid line are the fixed uh, are the fixed line in fixed servicing. And when we load the protection con to as you can see that the available channel is very limited. So you have a few channels in the uni five uni five frequency and a few channels in the uni six uni seven frequency. So that is very important that the regulator need to open the full 1.2 gigahertz for the standard power and AFC to operate. As you can imagine that if the Wi-Fi 6E standard, uh, standard power doesn't have the um, up 700 megahertz, the channel will be even more even more limited. So you may able to deploy your 40 megahertz network, but you're not, not able to deploy your 80 megahertz or 160 megahertz. 
So the AFC is not only protect the fixed service, AFC can also protect the radio astronomy, ser astronomy service via the exclusion zone rules. So for instance, the US and the Canada require protection of the RES site in the frequency 6650 to 66752 using the for, uh, using for following criteria. So the TX is the height of the unlicensed stand power access point and the RX is the height of the radio astronomy service. So this is uh, exclusion zoom of the radio astronomy service that the, if, if someone want to operate the standard power, they must have a certain separation distance to the radio astronomy service. And uh, the same protection mechanism can also be used for fixed satellite service from the space to Earth. So the, uh, and the same, it, it, and that AFC can also protect the fixed satellite service from Earth to space. So this is done by the uh, limited ERP radiating above the horizon. For example, in the, F in, in the US, the FCC requires standard power AP and a fixed client device located outdoor must limit their maximum ERP at any elevation angle above 30 degrees. And this rule is actually the same from as the UD1 5.1 gigahertz. So the rule is also in line with the WRC 19 resolution 229. So let's look at uh, the initial countries that enable and study the six gigahertz standard power. There is a growing momentum globally like adopt the standard power in the six gigahertz. And currently US and Canada are the two leading countries in the standard power. And the and the last month's Canada regulator I said just have another consultation on how the and the AFC specification, and there are also countries in the Asian, Asian Pacific and European re, European Union that the, the and under and it's currently on and AFC is currently under study in this place, and uh, I think it's about three weeks ago in um, in one of the ECC meeting WGFM one hundred two, the ECC has approved the six gigahertz standard power work items. And there are also, also other consultation from different ministry, ministry show there is the interest of using AFC. So I talked quite a lot of how the AFC can use the outdoor by using the GNSS or GPS function. But however, the AFC can also use the indoor as long as the AP can report its location. So the Wi-Fi industry is working on make, make this happen. Then in Aruba, in March this year, we have uh, announced our solution of indoor location capability. So this, uh, this solution uses a, use a fine time measurement between different AP to, uh, and to locate, to report the location. And a, so the FTM will allow the AP to report is a relative location, while at the same time, you might have an AP as an anchored AP that can connect with the GPS to, play and to anchor this relative location. And after the location has been identified, the AP will broadcast its location over the air to clients and support the open locate protocol and, pu and then publish over the cloud API. And finally, cl clients can use AP as a reference point to determine their own location. And this indoor, indoor standard power can enable a lot of use cases. So think about like in a hospital or in a factory and, and people can easily and can easily find where the equipment is located and find their and the interest the place they want to go. So this is a, a measurement we did through Aruba. So this blue, blue dot is anchored location that has a good visibility to the GNSS GPS, and all the red dot is the measure is the measure the relative location of those indoor AP, and after multiple time iteration. The, um, we can, um, as you can see that we have a pretty accurate of, uh, location for this indoor AP. All right, I'm going to stop here and pass the floor to uh, Chris. And uh, I've listed the reference document here if you uh, have an interest. And I hope this can, uh, I hope this web dialogue can help you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zing, for your presentation. So now I would like to invite uh, Mr. Gr Christopher Simansky, Director of Product Managing Technology Strategy for the Wireless Communication and Connectivity Division, Broadcom Inc., to start his presentation. Over to you, Mr. Christopher. Oh, great. Thank you very much. Um, so 
Uh, first, uh, APT, thank you very much for allowing me to uh, speak with you today. And Martha, uh, Dynamic Spectrum Alliance, we greatly appreciate your leadership and helping to promote policies that will enable more robust use of spectrum. So Sheen has done such a fantastic job laying the groundwork on AFC. I'm going to skip my presentation and really just get into the nuts and bolts uh, and show you a live demo. And uh, first I wanted to describe a little bit sort of Broadcom's view and priorities uh, for AFC. So we're a, a global <clears throat> leader in producing Wi-Fi chipsets. And when we approach a communications problem, we think all about scale. How can we produce a product and access the entire global market? Because that reduces our costs and it makes it easier to distribute the technology. When we were thinking about AFC, <clears throat> we asked ourselves, how can we ensure that this device class, standard power device class that the US is considering and, and Canada and these other countries, how can we ensure that uh, countries in Asia, such as South Korea or Cambodia or Indonesia, how can we ensure that this technology is available to meet those user needs? And so uh, Broadcom, along with um, Cisco and Meta, uh, created an open source software project called OpenAFC. It's under the Telecom Infra Project, and this is a completely open source project. And the whole goal here is to create a configurable system that can be used by anyone, anywhere to protect licensed operations. Uh, the idea is, can we operate in places and in frequencies where those frequent, where other uh, licensed incumbent users are not operating? So um, Sheen did such a, a fantastic job going through the details. I'm just gonna you know, build on, on what he had discussed. But if you wanna learn more about this open source software project, that has over 60 entities participating and 200 engineers collaborating, you can just Google OpenAFC and you can see the, the group leadership, our charter, or what it is we're, we're seeking to accomplish. What I will be demoing today is the OpenAFC software tool. And the, what I hope to drive home is that as regulators make the decision to enable standard power, there are tools where we can bring standard power products to market very, very quickly. Um, uh, we've created this, this scalable system. So first, I'm going to get into some of the details, what I like to call capacity building. What are you going to need in order for us to bring this technology uh, to your country? You know, what do you need? So I'm going to go through each one of these parameters a little bit. Um, I apologize uh, if I get a little bit too detailed, but uh, wanted to make this a little bit more of a practical demonstration. So uh, for OpenAFC, uh, the first thing I can do is show you that we're on our 20th revision. We're running 3.3.20. <laughs> so this began with a one. Um, and these are the various databases that we've integrated uh, into our, our AFC. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. So we've configured this so that we can add countries in here as regulators make standard power available. Uh, right now we have the continental United States and Canada, um, and as other countries come online, we'll have uh, them listed here. And, and this is an administrator configuration. Um, uh, this is not the type of access that anyone else would have. I'm an administrator of this system. Um, and in fact, what I'm showing you is what Broadcom will be running uh, to comply with the US and Canadian rules. We're applying to be an AFC operator for our access point manufacturer customers. So, um, so in the, once you set this, this drop down list, there's a variety of, of, of parameters here um, and databases that are integrated. So as, as Sheen had mentioned, there's this thing in the United States called a ULS database. And basically this is a list of all of the incumbent equipment that needs to be protected. And so the information in this list uh, might be the location of the fixed service receiver, 
the size of the antenna, um, uh, the, the, the height above terrain, uh, the type of radio that it is using. So it has all of the information necessary to conduct an interference calculation. And so OpenAFC has integrated um, an algorithm that contacts the US database on a daily basis. And it creates, a, it creates its own database. Um, then you have to set the minimum and maximum power that are allowed or, or, or wanted. In the United States, uh, the FCC requires that uh, the maximum power is 36 dBm and that the AFC provide um, a spectrum availability down to 21 dBm. So we've set these two parameters here. We've integrated a, a, the ability to add building penetration, penetration loss. We could, we could do this using P2109 and it would randomly assign uh, building entry loss. That doesn't really make sense for an AFC. So most of the regulators that we're speaking with say that they would apply a, a fixed value. So 20.5 is, is the fixed value that CEPT used in its interference studies, assuming that 30% of the buildings are uh, energy efficient and 70% and are, are traditional. Then um, there are other parameters here that are useful for an interference calculation. The polarization mismatch loss on average is going to be 3 dB. That is a typical parameter. Um, in ITU studies, we typically assume a feeder loss of between two and three dB. Uh, here we've set it at three dB for uni five and 2.5 dB for, for uni seven. We have to know the noise floor since our calculation is um, in an I over N um, interference above noise floor. We need to know what the receiver noise floor is uh, when we're doing this interference calculation. And uh, this is what's commonly used uh, by prospective AFC operators based upon discussions in industry bodies. Um, and so we use a dBm per megahertz because fixed service could be two megahertz, five megahertz, 20 megahertz, 30 megahertz, 60 megahertz bandwidth. And so the bandwidth can vary for the fixed service that we're protecting or the radio astronomy for that matter. And um, the bandwidth for the, the Wi-Fi device can also vary. So we normalize this on a, on a, on a, a dBm per megahertz. Um, we can set the I over N threshold to whatever the requirement is in the regulatory jurisdiction where AFC would be operating. As Sheen said, the, the interference threshold is a minus six I over N. We can also set the max distance that the access point should consider, the AFC should consider from the access point for all fixed services. So I, I could set this to uh, a thousand kilometers. Um, you know, the curvature of the earth you know, suggests that anything over 150 kilometers is probably unnecessary. Um, for our demonstration purposes, I'm gonna set this to 50. Uh, that's gonna cover about 98 percentile of uh, the interference cases and it'll allow the calculation to run a little quicker. Then we've also integrated the ability to put in very specific fixed service antenna patterns. Um, the Canadian government, I said, has published a bunch of antenna patterns. Wind Forum, uh, uh, an industry body that is working on AFC specifications, has published a variety of antenna patterns. And then we've also integrated a couple of ITU patterns, F699 is used for an individual or a single interferer, and F1245 is commonly used for probability analysis. So we've integrated these various patterns. Now, this concept's a little bit more complicated. When an access point provides its geolocation information, and I'll show you this in a moment, it provides a latitude and a longitude, but it also has to provide its uncertainty region. So it's going to be a circle or an oval uh, shape like that, uh, assuming that we're talking uh, GNSS uh, based or some sort of automated uh, uh, you know, geolocation technique. So if the um, size of the uncertainty region is large, like 50 or 100 meters, 
uh, how do we know that we've checked all of the possible places where the access point could be located in that uncertainty region? Well, we create a grid within this uncertainty region and the US requires the grid spacing to be 30 meters. And so it's 30 meters in terms of latitude and longitude and height is five meters. So this would create an, an uncertainty volume and we would place the access point in each place within this grid um, and determine the absolute worst case scenario where that access point could be interfering with incumbent operations. Um, and I'll show you what that looks like in a moment. Um, for propagation model, we first began by doing just free space path loss. And as anyone can tell you, when you're doing free space path loss, that doesn't leave very much in terms of channel availability, uh, but the technology has matured and so has the regulatory uh, requirements. And um, <clears throat> we moved then to ITM with building data, and then the FCC developed its report and order requirements. And the FCC said, well, if you're within 30 meters of a fixed service, then use free space path loss. If you're between 30 meters and one kilometer, use winner two. If you're over a kilometer, use ITM. And if the access point is located in an urban or suburban area, use P2108. If it is located in a, a rural area, use the ITU model P452, okay? And so these are the various propagation models and clutter models that are in use. But the US um, and Canadian governments also said that you know, where there is building data, uh, we want you uh, to use that building data to determine whether or not the path is winner to line of sight or the path is winner to non-line of sight. And so uh, that is also a requirement. Now, there might not only be building databases for a small you know, portion uh, of a country, uh, and where you don't have the building uh, uh, data to make that determination, there's a formula of, of, of using a combined model. So this, this is how the US has uh, instituted its rules and how, how Canada has uh, uh, drafted its rules and it's, it's seeking comments. So you can see here, all of these parameters have a probabilistic component and different countries may make different choices. So Open AFC chose to make this completely configurable. Uh, in the United States, uh, there's been no decision on the confidence that should be made. Uh, can, can, Canadian ISED is saying that you should assume 5% confidence and 20% reliability. So what we wanted to do is make this configurable so that it could scale regardless of the decision that each regulatory authority made around the globe so that we could quickly uh, provide this technology for um, uh, standard power devices. And so um, when we select no building database, um, then the only thing that is used is the terrain source. So the United States government publishes something um, from the US geological uh, survey data called 3DEP. And it's based upon one arc second grid, which, uh, you know, uh, where we are in the globe in the US, it's about 30 meters by 30 meters. So um, this, is, this is how we um, determine the terrain. And then we also have to determine the propagation environment uh, because the ITU formula say that when you're in a, a rural area, you should take less propagation loss. And when you're in a suburban or urban area, you should take more propagation loss. Well, the US and Canada have this database called NLCD. And this allows uh, you to determine whether or not you're in an urban or suburban or rural area. And that will change the values of clutter that you actually apply in doing your interference analysis. But it is also possible uh, we've integrated a population density map. So not all governments are going to have this uh, database, but uh, it's likely possible, uh, much more, more, more possible that uh, governments that don't have other uh, land cover databases will have a population density map. And so this is another way to determine urban, suburban, or, or rural. So all of this has been 
implemented uh, so that we can bring this uh, uh, to market very quickly as governments uh, uh, decide to move forward. Then all of these ITM parameters are configurable. We've set this at the baseline that's most commonly used for interference analyses. Uh, but once again, if a government wants us to use a different parameter, we can establish that very, very quickly and bring this product to market. Um, there's the ability to add clutter at the fixed service receiver. Um, this is configured so that you can say, you know, the percentage of locations. So at 5% for P2108, that's about 20 dB in clutter. Um, governments likely will only allow this for fixed service equipment that is uh, lower in elevation. So this is configurable. You can configure whether or not you can apply clutter at the fixed service receiver and um, for the maximum height above the ground, right? So these are also configurable parameters. And then the allowed frequency ranges. And, and as Sheen said, um, uh, uni in the US, uh, 5925 to 6425 is allowed, then 6525 to 6875. Well, in Canada, it's 5925 to 6850. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, you can configure this for, for each and every um, uh, regulatory domain. So this is uh, just an update on the information that would be needed. Uh, and so we can provide a list after this uh, uh, briefing to give you sort of a combined, okay, this is what the data would need to look like for the database um, of the fixed services. Uh, this is what we would need in terms of decisions, regulatory decisions that are made, basically model rules. And then, uh, you know, with, with this type of information, um, uh, we, could, we could bring this to market in, in your jurisdiction. So Virtual AP implements the Wi-Fi Alliance AFC system to device interface specification. So this is a standardized specification. And as Sheen was talking about, the Wi-Fi Alliance has published test plans to make sure that AFCs are, are compliant and test plans to make sure that access points are compliant. So this is the information that an access point must know in order for an AFC to provide a channel availability calculation. So for instance, I've created a dummy serial number this would look up a database of serial numbers and see if the uh, access point has an FCC ID. If I try to run this, it says this specific device is not allowed to operate under AFC control because it didn't have an approved device. So then I send the request again, we're missing the certification ID. So this is a fail safe to make sure that um, the device that is using the AFC is legally authorized to operate in, 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 here in the United States. The access point would provide the location type. Is it an ellipse or is it a linear polygon or radio polygon? If this is going to be automated like GNSS, then it's going to be an ellipse. And what I've done is I've provided the latitude and longitude of the location where the US, in the US where the uh, American football, the Super Bowl was played last year in Los Angeles um, to, to use as my demo. And we can randomly look at other locations as well. But um, uh, here, uh, the access point would be saying that its area of uncertainty is uh, 50 meters by 50 meters, so a circle. And the orientation is zero degrees. The access point would have to know its height. So here, 15 meters, and it's communicating that it's the height above ground level. The access point could also give an ASML uh, uh, number, and that could be converted. Uh, height above mean sea level. And then um, the access point would have to know its height uncertainty. Um, you know, typical GNSS product is probably going to be somewhere between seven and and you know, um, you know, 15 meters uncertainty, depending on how much clutter is it in an urban canyon. I'm using only two meters here, just because it'll uh, conduct a faster calculation. Then once again, need to know that it's a minimum desired EIRP. Um, so the access point could say, okay, I know, I mean, legally, you know, I could get up to 21, but you know, I, I want channels that are at least you know, 24 dBm or whatever. 
Um, and then the access point would have to uh, say whether it's indoor or outdoor. So all of this is sent using the specification. And then it says what channels that it wants. Does it want a 20 megahertz, a 40 megahertz, 80 megahertz, 160? Um, and so here I'm sending this request and you'll see that this is actually, in, this is instantiated in uh, Amazon Cloud. And so it's taking some time. Um, and you can see, here's my area of uncertainty. Here's the location. This is Sophie Stadium. And uh, life is really good if you wanna deploy uh, an access point in, in Sophie Stadium here. Uh, only one channel uh, has to reduce its power. All these other channels are allowed to transmit at 36 dBm EIRP. That's the maximum allowed power. This one shows yellow because if it trans transmitted at 36 dBm, it would exceed the I over M threshold. And this is really just a different view. Here, it shows in this channel, all these different uh, channels uh, we're allowed to transmit at 36 dBm, and in, in this channel, uh, this uh, uh, 20 megahertz channel, uh, we are we are stuck at uh, what is that? You know, 30, 33 dBm. And so, you know, why did it take eight seconds to do? Um, well, we actually ran an interference calculation. So this is the output we store. We wanted to make sure when we were configuring this that it was all accurate. So these are all of the calculations that were run in order to determine whether or not uh, that device uh, could transmit and on, and on what channel. So if I just look down here, this shows that there were 142,596 different FS to RLAN interference calculations. Uh, it shows the latitude and longitude of the fixed service, it shows the angle at which uh, the RLAN energy was going into the fixed service antenna. Um, it shows all of the specifications. What's the type of terrain that was used? Is it an urban area or suburban area? Uh, what's interesting here, you can see some of these are urban and some of them are suburban uh, as marked by the NLCD database. Uh, but you see all of this information that went into determining whether or not it met the I over M threshold. And so these I over Ns you can see here are minus 88 and minus 92. So it's, it's not even close, uh, but uh, there must have been some that would have exceeded minus six uh, because as we look on our, on our map here, uh, we have one channel where we have reduced power. So what are these lines that you're looking at? Well, these are the FS beams. So if I uh, scroll out here on my map, you can see all these beams that are crisscrossing in Los Angeles, Sophie Stadium. And um, this is just a tremendous number of fixed service uh, interference analyses that were done here. Um, and so uh, you look at this and you think, well, you know, how could I operate at this power level? Well, it has to do with the fact that the NLCD database knows that you're operating in clutter. So as a, as a quick demonstration or a proof of concept to what I'm talking about, what happens if I said, instead of Sophie Stadium, I wanted to operate in the parking lot at that elevation, okay? So this parking lot probably is not gonna have as much clutter as the inside of the stadium. And so I've placed this access point and we'll see if uh, the demo will, will work here, um, doing this live. And here we see we're within a beam pattern and some of these channels are now red. Uh, 23 dBm is the maximum power. And so the AFC system knew based upon all of the parameters fed to it and required by the uh, FCC that um, you know, this was more sensitive in these channels that would have, cre it would have uh, exceeded the, the threshold. So, you know, we can run an interference analysis literally uh, anywhere. But one of the key points that um, I want to raise here is that um, rarely will you find that every channel is, is green. 
And so this is one of the reasons why more spectrum is necessary to achieve, you know, to, to meet these use cases. So, uh, for example, um, if I wanted to provision service in another location, and uh, maybe I'm, I'm uh, a little closer uh, in the city or closer to uh, where fixed service antennas are. So uh, let's do this interference analysis here. Um, when I send my request, I'm very close to a lot of fixed service antennas here. <clears throat> and you're gonna find that it's entirely a, a different uh, a channel availability map than uh, where I wasn't really in the beam pattern. So uh, this <laughs> is not what you'd be looking for if you were a standard power access point and you wanted to operate here. Um, so uh, very limited channel availability compared to Sophie Stadium. Now there still are channels because there are fixed service that are far away in these frequencies. So I could still operate at a higher power, but this is the reason why when we're talking about automated frequency coordination, you need a, access to a lot more spectrum. You need that channel diversity to provision a service. Um, so this is the basic gist. Um, the good news is once again, all of this is built to scale. So if you're interested in more information, please reach out. I'm happy to provide a one-to-one a, a -one demo. OpenAFC is delighted to work on configuring this for your regulatory domain, and we're, we're delighted to help you with the capacity building where we can. Um, this can be used really for any technology. If someone wanted to, they can convert this to use it for TV white spaces or for the 12 gigahertz band or the 15 gigahertz band or whatever. Uh, administrations could use this for their own planning tool. Uh, it has all of the various propagation algorithms and um, um, computed. And so what it really needs is the land database, um, building databases where required, and then, um, you know, the information pertaining to the incumbent systems that uh, need to be protected. Um, so that, that concludes my presentation, and I'll be uh, delighted to uh, answer any questions. Thank you, Christopher, uh, for your presentation. So uh, we can now open the floor for the question and answer session. So uh, the participants, if you have any questions, kindly raise your hands or drop the questions in the chat box. So as of now, we have uh, three questions. Uh, the first one is uh, from Zaramon. She says, like, does AFC differs from the existing automation, automated frequency management system, AFMS, used by various telecoms regulator agencies? Yes, Christopher. Yeah, so I, I don't know enough about AFMS to give a direct comparison, but when I was speaking, I gave a demo uh, for the UK Ofcom. Um, and also uh, have given uh, uh, this demo for a variety of other regulators, and they thought that this could be used for frequency planning. Um, their view was that because you could integrate any database into this and in any um, uh, frequency range, that this tool could be used by a regulator for frequency planning. Uh, that's not how it was designed. That's not the intention. Uh, but uh, what I've heard from regulators is that it would be possible to use this tool. So um, I think probably some additional design, design work would be needed. Uh, but the way that a regulator should look at this is this is a cloud-based uh, management system basically doing live interference calculations to determine if there's a frequency that is being used or not used or if you put a frequency in use, would it, would it degrade another uh, uh, device, a license holder's operation? So, you know, theoretically, it's the same function. It, just add on top of that, that the AFMS is, uh, I see that is a comprehensive regu regulatory tool specifically designed for the regulator to assign a frequency or notify ITU for any assignment. While the AFC only do a specific job that for the six gigahertz spectrum sharing, 
I'm not quite sure if AF, AFMS can do um, cloud computing for the interference management to calculate the protection, but the AFC is designed for, with, for that purpose. And in terms of the um, business model that the AFMS is uh, used by the regulator. So the regulator is the only user for this system for them to assign a frequency report to ITU, while the AFC is designed for the industry. There can be multiple AFC window that each one compete or coordinate with each other to deliver the solution for the industry, while the regulator only have uh, the uh, only will approve the, the different windows solution. That's my observation. Thank you. Mm, thank you. So yes, I think we can understand on um, both of you. So the next question is from Mai. It's like with the implementation of six gigahertz on AFC, will it affect the uh, FFC for unlicensed operation for Wi-Fi of six gigahertz? Will it affect uh, the uh, six gigahertz unlicensed operations Wi-Fi. Uh, yes, so um, AFC is required for the device class standard power. So if I want to operate at higher power, or um, you know, um, South Korea enabled the combination of 5G with Wi-Fi 6E to provision wireless broadband and the underground trains and the subways. Those types of devices require uh, connectorized antennas in a subway. You, you, can't, you can't use an integrated antenna. So in the US, to use a connectorized antenna, uh, we would have to use uh, standard power equipment. So um, all of these use cases that are not allowed right now um, you know, stadium deployments, even if they're indoor, if they require uh, connectorized antennas or they're weatherproofed enclosures, um, you're not allowed to deploy those in the U.S. Uh, under the low power indoor rules. So with AFC, uh, the Super Bowl, uh, you know, if it were open air or Sheen was showing Ohio State Stadium, which has a capacity, I think, of about 85,000 people, and that's outdoor, no six gigahertz access. But soon as AFC operators are authorized, uh, you can use six gigahertz Wi-Fi where that capacity is, is really, really needed. So my expectation is that uh, AFC is going to enable uh, wireless broadband deployment in the, in the places that it's needed most very, very rapidly in the US. Yeah. I also think on the technical side that because Wi-Fi using a self-coordination mechanism, each device use a contention based uh, and so you listen before talk a protocol. So if you have a six gigahertz standard power, it will also be aware, it will be also aware of the surrounding Wi-Fi equipment. So if the if the if the standard power AP find that some channel is occupied by other Wi-Fi equipment, it will avoid the transmit. So I don't think this standard power will affect other Wi-Fi deployment because they all use a self coordination. So that's again then. In, implicit the importance that we need the whole 1.2 gigahertz for the spectrum access because if you think that in a congested network you might have a standard power meeting such a requirement while you have a low power indoor VRP for other requirement so that's if we only have the 500 megahertz the spectrum can be very congested it doesn't allow a dense network to be operated yes thank you for uh, that answer so our next question is from Zarmoon. So it is for SP, the user cannot buy an AP and install by themselves, correct? It looks like the license to install the AP station is required regardless of the unlicensed frequency use. So actually, no, a, a user, the way that the US, so once again, every regulator is going to have to make a determination on the rules for standard power. But in the United States, someone could buy um, uh, an access point off the web from uh, Amazon, or uh, you could go to Carrefour and uh, you know, buy an buy a access point. 
the user could install that access point and obtain standard power service um, uh, and be connected to an AFC. The requirement is that there's a contractual relationship between the AFC operator and that standard power device has been registered or uh, is capable, is authorized to app operate as a standard power access point. And then the United States made a requirement that the uh, geolocation capability had to be integrated into the access point. So not necessarily internal, but it had to be an integrated solution and it had to be automatic. So that meant that a user couldn't just type in geolocation coordinates like I did for demonstration. Uh, it would be uh, the geolocation capability of that device automatically sending those coordinates um, to the AFC. Now, each calculation that I showed you costs money. Um, you know, conducting 150,000 computations in the cloud for just that one location uh, every day is going to have a, a cloud-based cost. It's going to have some processing costs. And so, you know, the AFC would only do this then for an access point that's author authorized or is authenticated. And so there would have to be a contractual relationship and there would have to be an authentication mechanism between the access point and the AFC. Uh, but, um, you know, it's my expectation that these access points will be uh, provided by enterprises, uh, uh, service providers. So uh, APT operator, a the APT could become an operator and could provision standard power access points and then pay an AFC operator uh, to provide this service, or they could integrate that service themselves using Open AFC. Thank you, Christopher. So anything Dr. Zing would like to uh, add up to that one? No, okay. thank you. Thank you. So we have another question from Izata. So he says, like, what happened when the available frequency will be used by the incumbent? Do the AP ha have request for a new frequency or AFC will automatically assign a new frequency to use? Okay, I can answer that. So when AP requests to request the AFC for other channel availability, the AFC doesn't re respond just for one channel, just one channel for the AP to operate. Instead, the AFC will report all the available channel with maximum ERP that the AP are free to choose. So if the, um, if the incumbent situation changed after 24 hours, because we talked about the dynamic, uh, dynamic coordination, and the, AP, the AFC will report back the latest available channel information for AP to update, I hope that can uh, answer your question. So you might have a one day AP operating on one channel, the next day if incumbent change, the AP have to switch to another channel to operate. Yes, okay. Uh, thank you for that one. So um, another question we have it from uh, Paris Patel. So he says, uh, can six gigahertz Wi-Fi with standard power coexist with IMT 5G also can it go uh, uh, exist with FF, FSS? Yeah, so I can I can uh, I can answer that. So um, I uh, personally do not believe that uh, six gigahertz Wi-Fi or six gigahertz uh, 5G NRU uh, uh, is compatible with IMT. Um, uh, IMT 2020 has key performance indicators that require high throughput and high reliability and low latency. Uh, same thing that uh, we are designing Wi-Fi 6E and Wi-Fi 7 for. So if we were talking about 2G uh, edge <laughs> cellular and Wi-Fi 3, then maybe. But uh, you know, IMT systems are meant to uh, operate at very, very high capacity. Um, and uh, Wi-Fi has something called listen before talk protocol. And so um, you would never be able to transmit because the IMT would always be talking. 
And the IMT is not listening before it's talking. So if at some point uh, the Wi-Fi is transmitting, uh, the IMT would not be aware of that that system, and so it would it would create interference, both in-channel and adjacent channel interference. Um, six gigahertz Wi-Fi can coexist well with fixed service and with fixed satellite service, um, no problem. And so that's what all of the interference studies have shown in Europe and Mexico and Canada and Japan and the United States. Um, they can coexist with the right uh, rules. And, and that really that's primarily, uh, you know, operate indoors because the incumbents aren't operating indoors. Or if you're operating outdoors, use a database or point your antenna down rather than pushing all of your energy up in the sky towards the satellite. So with, with these simple rules, incumbent systems do not have to be relocated. And what regulators are doing is increasing the density of use with six gigahertz Wi-Fi. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Christopher. I think that answers the questions from Mr. Patel. So we have another one from uh, Yamin. Uh, she says like, the AFC is strong relied on FS database. However, many countries don't have such database. It would lose the fundamental information for operation. More importantly, minus six TV is not enough um, to protect FS. This is not aligned with the protection criteria defined by ITUR. ITUR F758 um, uh, defines the long-term protection criteria to protect FS, which is minus 10 dB, uh, so 4 dB difference here. So he has a question. Yeah, so I think this is a really, really good question. So I'd first like to take the database question. So this is part of what I was talking about capacity building. Uh, administrations would have to develop a database. This database can be a simple CSV file or an Excel file. And as long as it has the right parameters, um, in there, then you can you can protect the incumbent system. So um, uh, this might be something that <clears throat> takes some time to develop that that capacity. Um, in some countries, um, like in uh, Germany, Germany does not want to provide its fixed link operations to the public. So a country like Germany might only provide the licensed information to uh, a specific AFC operator. There might be one operator, or they could use open AFC and, and Germany uh, could become the AFC operator. Binetsa could become the AFC operator. So there's a variety of models. In the US and Canada, they make the information publicly available. If a, uh, if a regulator believes that this is uh, nationally sensitive information because it's for uh, services like public safety or, um, you know, uh, uh, energy systems, nuclear facilities, et cetera, um, then, uh, then this can either be um, provided contractually to a couple of operators or, or they can do it themselves. Um, but uh, that's, that's, I think, how that would work. As it relates to minus six I over N, um, yeah, different countries have a different perspective. Um, the ITUR criteria is minus 10 I over N 20% of the time. That is the long-term interference protection criteria. The short-term interference protection criteria is plus 19 I over N. Uh, so it is 29 dB higher threshold. Well, because you don't know how long that access point is going to be operating, the FCC just chose a fixed value and so did Canada. Uh, but AFC operators can configure however the regulator wants. So if the regulator wants to provide zero dB protection or uh, uh, minus six, which is uh, minus six I over N is basically reducing the, the margin by one dB. It's a one dB degradation on the margin. Um, or we could set it for minus 10 or minus 20, whatever the regulator deems uh, necessary. But all of that is, is configurable. Uh, 
Yes, thank you. So we have, uh, I think, one on uh, Mr. Hassan answer to Mr. Patel because of inheritance cellular network design of 5G and uh, execute uses of uh, channel by 5G operator, frequency coordination with IMT is not possible. So yes, thank you, Mr. Hassan, for your reply. I think uh, our panelists also try to explain the same. Uh, yes, uh, I think we have now come to the end of the question and answer session. Like we have no further questions. Uh, uh, we have that is the all we have received. So, um, if there is no uh, further questions um, from the participants, uh, I would like to share you another information that uh, we have shared the feedback form link uh, for the survey uh, in the chat box. So, I would like to request all the participants to kindly submit your feedback form. Yes, um, now I think we have come to the end. I think um, if the speaker would like to share anything uh, for their last thought, thoughts, so they are welcome. I just want to add one point that uh, because that uh, um, conversation really interested me that talking about the 5G coordination. I don't think that if a regulator today enables the six gigahertz for Ireland, they don't need a lot of a spectrum migration or vacant the incumbents. They can immediately real, uh, real uh, they can immediately implement the benefits of the six gigahertz. However, if you think about implementing five G, you have to go through a lot of a frequency uh, assign and uh, frequency migration. You have to. There are also studies shows that IMT cannot coexist with a fixed set hard service. Thank you. I would simply like to just once again uh, thank you all for attending and your attention. Uh, we, you know, Broadcom believes that. Uh, six gigahertz use for wireless broadband is really the most important issue uh, uh, for connectivity over the next, uh, you know, 10 or 15 years. Um, you know, indoor operations and outside uh, point to point operations, we think that six gigahertz is critical. And we thank you for taking the time to understand our, pers our, our perspective and, and listening to this talk. And, uh, we would love to be a resource in any way that we can, but but thank you again for your time. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Zing and uh, Mr. Christopher for your uh, sharing uh, your experience and all the demonstrations. So uh, now I think we will close the sessions. And I, in the last, I would also like to thank uh, DSA for kindly uh, collaborating this program with us. And I lastly, uh, thank you all the participants for your uh, at, uh, kind attention, also sharing us uh, uh, interactively in the Q&A sessions. Yes. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Ka. Bye bye. Ka.